four weeks later. This defeats the very purpose of this. this the purpose of this was for people who are really down on but no employment and no money. And you want to really put money in their hands by doing something which is useful. So you give them something to do, you know, road construction, uh, water harvesting, uh, construction, whatever, something like that. And then you pay them. But if you don't pay them for two, three weeks, they get disabled. They don't want to come, they don't get the money, and it creates great problems for them. The second problem was that the process of the money going from Delhi to the state, to the local place, to the village, and reaching the actual person in the world, that long pipeline had lots of leaks in it. So what reaches at the other end was you know, very often a fraction of what is put in at one end. Systems tried to improve it, they tried to do things but wasn't quite good. Now one of the interesting things that's been done, the first stage was to use mobiles to try and send something to the person as an alert, to get some feedback, not necessarily from that person but somebody there. Now we are experimenting that where people have a mobile, and that's why I mentioned the number of 700 million. Now not all of those who are destitute have a mobile very obviously. But some of them do, so we are trying this as a pilot in the stage when somebody has to be able to do it. Is can you transfer the money directly to the mobile in some form? And then from the mobile, this person can go to an authorized person, a banking correspondent, or later even the local <coughs> grocery shop, and on the basis of that, he can have cash it. It's like a check, except that except for a physical check, it comes in the form of something on the mobile. It's not very different from the prepaid card where you paid your money and then you get the money, you something for it. So you're building value into the mobile. Now, some experiments are going on on this. Already, and you would have seen ads of that, this is rolled out commercially with things like Airtel Money, where you can send money between mobile phones. Now, the kind of prospect for a thing like this to be able to cut down a lot of the leakages, a lot of the delays, is phenomenal. It's yet early stages, so not all of it is going to happen. It may not happen for the NREGA. But in many other areas, you're beginning to see how this use of technology to be able to get money across to people really begins to work. Many other such examples, and I don't want to dwell too much on them. I want to just tell you one or two things about coming back to what we said of where some of these things work and where they don't. I mentioned transparency, and you know I must tell you one story on the transparency part, which you know, I find very intriguing because to me it typifies different elements of the India of today. It's not really a cynical story, so don't take it as being a cynic, but I think it's there. You know, this story is about two, and you know, with apologies to Mr. Rani, it, you can use anybody, but I would use chief ministers, which is what many people do. So, you know, the two chief ministers were great friends from two different states. So the chief minister from state one chats with his friend and says, how are things going? You've been there now three or four years, and so on. So I'm doing very well, I'm happy, the state's doing all that. He said, personally, I was, he said, I'm doing fine, I've built a lovely new house, you must come and see it. So one day he goes there, and he sees a palatial building. He says, my God, the chief minister's salary, you don't get much money, and yeah, there's some, you know, things here and there, but how do you build such a house? He said, I'll show you, come. So he says, come up, takes him to the terrace, and he points the distance. You see that? He said, yeah, that's a huge, big, Dam, isn't it? He said, yeah, it's a big dam. It's a very nice, great dam. Must have done a lot of good. Yeah, he said, done a lot of good. He said, hold on, you brought me up to tell me something about your house. You know, what has this got to do with? He said, you see that dam again? He said, yeah. He said, 10 percent. <laughs> so, then, six months later, this chief minister with a nice house brings up his friend and says, yeah, I'm coming to your state. Can I come and visit you? He said, yeah, sure, of course, come. So, he goes there. And he sees a house which is three times his size. He said, you are envying my house and you got such a house. So I didn't know this. He said, no, no, I built it very fast in the last eight months. He said, tell me your secret. You know, I told you what I did. But how can you build such a big house in the state? He said, not doing so well. He said, I'll show you. Come with me. He takes him to the terrace. This guy's one thing. He said, what is he? He said, just make fun of me or what I did. And he points out there. He said, you see that dam? This first chief minister is even more irritated. He said, no, he's playing some game on me, you know, which I said the same thing. He said, what dam? There's no dam there. He said, ah, that's the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, transparent, I think, completely. <laughs> Not visible. I said, it's a bit of a cynical story, but it talks of the problems of governance. I mentioned that in the context of wanting to wind up what I'm saying, by saying that, you know, these things on technology, and many more examples which I had, but I don't want to give you a chat about them. 
this thing about technology are great, and I, I am convinced that they can do a lot to bring in efficiency, transparency, accountability, ease of citizen services, comfort for citizens, lots of the good things that we must do. But they're not enough. There is yet the issue of ethics. And we are very clever people, very, very clever. As I tell you from this example, or I talked a little bit earlier about the mobile. I've gone to many countries around the world, and one or two countries is just catching up. But we were the first and the recently the only country that has the concept of a missed call. How do you know what a missed call is? You don't pay anything, not the receiver pay anything, you can make your message. The telephone company is crying, you know, how do I make money from these things? This is Indian ingenuity. Now with that ingenuity, with all your transparency and accountability which you can do with technology, with all the things which I didn't mention about, you know, satellites to track stuff, I called, we were just chatting about it earlier, but India was telling me about how in Sangli, somebody had done that. And now in Delhi, they like to use GIS to get you know properties which are encroached on, map them from space and satellite and so on. These things can and will be done. But given our ingenuity, we'll find a way around it. We always do. So end of the day, if you want governance to be really good, there is no alternative to saying that we need to do all these for a number of reasons, but we also need ethics to be involved in and values to be there. Without that, you do all the technology and you yet find some way of defeating it. As you know, technology often defeats itself. It's a story of you know missiles and anti-missiles, bombs and bigger bombs. So you always find some technology. You find you know everything encrypted on your data. So when you give your credit card number, it's all encrypted, nobody can get at it. Then you find one guy who's smarter who does some decryption of it, and again the data gets stolen. So these wars between technologies go on. And there will always be somebody who is a little smarter and finds a way around the system. And the only way to protect that, not on a hundred percent basis, but one more, you might say, level of protection, one more addition to your defenses, has to be ethics. And that to me is the strongest one. That goes beyond technology, it's not something which is there. But when you talk of good governance by technology, and that's why I intentionally use, titled this as technology as a tool. It's a tool, it's not necessary a solution. It's a tool. But you need more powerful tools and to me the most powerful tool at the end of the day, technology or no technology, is ethics. And if you have ethics, it's like the process one I mentioned earlier. If you just put in technology without process improvement, marginal improvement but no big deal. If you put in technology with process improvement but without ethics, yes, substantial improvement but not big. You need certainly to re-engineer the process, you definitely need technology but you also need ethics to be added to. Let me stop there. I had a few more things here and there, but I'm sure there'll be questions and comments, and I'd be happy to leave my additional points in it. Thank you. Uh, uh, you spoke extensively about the delivery of all the services to a common man. I, uh, I thought it would be talking something, sort of counter pressure on the uh, politicians and the uh, leaders who represent us. If I, uh, if I believe correctly, you see, one of the biggest issues with our country is about uh, the politics itself, the representative itself, is a huge problem in itself, as some of us perceive. That they, make, they make things difficult, uh, there is no really transparency, they are, there is no accountability uh, to our constitution on the, uh, on the people who are highly responsible to do things, and so on and so forth. And uh, <coughs> I don't think you are going to highlight some of the issues that, uh, just like uh, the television media made uh, the Representative is still responsible and people on responsible position, more responsible, responsible, responsible. Is there a system which you pursue uh, through this so called uh, technology that uh, the representatives and the government systems itself get pressure to get more responsible? I think you made an extremely good point. I, I didn't even touch on that part. I look at my notes, I do have that on media. I think technology as a tool indirectly is extremely powerful, especially in a democracy. And we're beginning to see use of that in India. Sometimes misuse, without a doubt. The media tends to go overboard, does things. But I think the media as a technology is a phenomenal tool. First, to create awareness. Second, to create public opinion and therefore pressure. And third, not always very wisely, but sometimes it does happen, by using technology to entrap people. You've just seen a recent case where that's happened. You know. 
So I think those are, you know, there's, there's a thin line between what there is ethical and what is not. But certainly it's being used. So I, you're absolutely right. Technology used in these ways, is, I think it's very critical. It's also, we've seen examples elsewhere in the world where technology has been used in a very different way. So called Arab Spring, where you know, through things like Facebook, just SMSs, emails going back and forth, uh, a very amorphous movement coalesced into something very big. And I think we've seen examples where technology is used in those ways to begin to build things on people. Uh, we've also seen examples where technology has played the role of not just exposing, but of pushing things in a certain direction and getting something done. And I said it's two-edged tool, but I think it is at its power. But you know, I must say one thing which I didn't touch on at all. And I, I address this very often to my corporate friends. I know how many of you from the corporate world. At the end of the day, all of us love to slam politicians or bureaucrats, sometimes both of them. And I think some of it, frankly, is justified. But we forget that very often, it's, it's you know, we talk of corruption, it's the giver. And the giver of the bribe is not always the two kinds of broad types of corruption. One is the exploitative account, where I have power, so I demand something from you. But the other is not, it's a non-exploitative, it's, it's a bribe giving kind, and that comes mostly in the corporates. And what I'm saying is the context of what you said, the media and the pressure, you find a lot of media pressure on politicians today, even on bureaucrats, there are a lot of exposes, a lot of things that come up from those, and you're beginning to see those having an impact. But on the corporate world, I'm yet to see any single thing. And I'll give you one very concrete example, not naming companies, I'm not singling them out, because there are many others. Case in Karnataka on mining, lots of things, you know, and the politicians there, one chief minister had to resign. But obviously somebody gave him bribes. I haven't yet seen any corporate CEO having to resign on that basis. The Twitchy thing is different, but on the mining one. And it is known that one or two companies were the ones that were there. And they are even bigger away in Chhattisgarh. But they somehow seem to get away. So I am sorry, I am deviating a bit. So your overall question is absolutely right. But I'm saying that also this tool we should look at it not just to address the governance problems or one part of the governance system, but there are other elements of governance, corporate governance being one of them, which also need to be looked at very seriously. Corporate governance in our country has improved, but I think is in serious problem. Corporate ethics and corporate governance to me is lots of question marks, as many, at least if not more, than now I can give you one example. You are talking, you are on the committee of NRI, uh, Narega scheme. Let me tell you sir, I am on the evaluating committee and I have found out lot of misuse of this Narega funds. Lot of wrong names being entered, lot of money being siphoned. It is taxpayers money and you should do something about it. And our suggestion would be, you make UID compulsory for the guy who is going to take that. Why can't you do it? It is being refused by your states also. So you would see that your ministers account for it. These are the ministers who are blocking it. And if you see that if you uh, make this compulsory, lot of yields can be taken care of. Not only that, like you know, in the, some of the states that you have not mentioned, those states, you know, they talk about, you know, corruption uh, being reduced. But corruption is being increased with the help of technology. One simple thing I tell you, in an RTO department, the administrator has to punch, otherwise the uh, thing doesn't got to get, uh, uh, you know, entered into and the number is not released. So, the administrator being the deputy director of RTO does not punch the thing unless the money is transferred to him. Now, is this a, you know, use of technology for uh, corruption? Now, these are the things which need to be highlighted. These are the things which need, and there, there is to be technology which has to, uh, uh, you know, take, uh, uh, you know, cognizance of the malfunctioning of the technology. And if that is done, I think a lot of years, and since you mentioned it, it is the bureaucracy, it is the politicians who need to be corrected first. Uh, uh, this uh, corporate will fall in line automatically. Your, your point on the UID is absolutely right. I think some of us have been trying hard to see how the UID can be used. I didn't even mention the UID, so I'm glad you brought that up. It's an excellent example of how technology can play a role in bringing transparency and ease across. And as you would know, there is a degree of resistance and problems there. But it is slowly being overcome. But there is. Now, once you have UID, I think things would become very much easier. Again, I will not say corruption will go away. As I said I reiterate that we are very clever people and somebody is going to pay it off. The example you gave is a good one of the RTO. You know, you have all of it, but this guy ultimately you need somebody who has to say yes. It can't go away. 
the only thing is that even there, I know one or two states that have seen this and have corrected it by saying that when there's a delay, it has to be reported to the next level. Now, how many levels are corrupt? You can say they're all in league, then there's no hope. But I'm, I'm not so cynical. I think there are a lot of very, very good people, and there are very many good people, but there are corrupt elements. And somehow we have to see what you can do about them. The technology itself, as you rightly said, and I re reiterate what I said, it's a tool. And it's a two-edged tool. It can be used either to accelerate corruption, you can do it, or it can be done to take away corruption. That works both ways. On the NREJ, as I mentioned to you, there is leakage, very high leakage, it's known. In some states where good systems have been put in place, mainly through technology, the leakage is there, but it's much lower. In some states, it's huge, it's huge. And I'll give you one example to reiterate, to you know, to emphasize the point you made. In some of the states, I don't want to name them, the Sarpanch election, the amount being spent on that has gone up by 10 times in two years. 10 times. Reason is very simple. The money, as I said, is at the moment rooted through them. So this has become a very clear indirect surrogate indicator for saying obviously a lot of money is going. How else can they afford to put so much money into the election of a Sarpanch, which was not seen as anything terribly great and which was decided by you know, some elders sitting around. So this is happening. It's a reality in the country as we go ahead. To me, technology can and should solve any of these, but it is not, I repeat, not the ultimate solution. As long as you have somebody somewhere in the chain who is corrupt, he or she will find some way. And so, ultimately, I repeat, it's, it's ethics, number one. But number two, I also want to mention this, which I didn't earlier. It has to be social pressure. Tell me that guy, the RTO, is doing this and making money. His colleagues know of it. Undoubtedly, his neighbors know of it. He is living there. What does he do with the money? In some way, it must show. And they all know what he earns. So they know it's there. Unless socially frown on these things, it's a problem. You question on corporates. I'm sorry, I'm going on, but as I said, I'll take, take some of my points to answer this. You know, even there. In the 50s, when they were in the primary schools, the education quality at the in the in the basic school, the primary school was very good. Now, if you see the government school quality is 100 times worse, and the payment to teachers and other things. Uh, uh, at that time around 60 rupees, 100 rupees per teacher. Now the minimum salary is around 50,000 to 50,000 rupees per, te per teacher. But the quality is bad. And unless we uh, improve in this, and, uh, and, the, and the use of technology is there, uh, I think that the whole system can improve. Don't no, Your point on education is very well taken. I agree with you. It's a bit of a complex issue because you know also the status of the teacher, though you're actually right, the salaries have gone up. In fact, I don't know what it is here. In Delhi, it's not 24,000, that's the minimum salary for a primary school teacher, which by any standard is very respectable. Yeah. But here is a certain state kilometers per hour on some road and kill a few people and then say, don't you know who I am, which is the Delhi thing, you know. Nandan, I call no. So I told Nandan, I must mention this to somebody mentioned ID. I said, Nandan, your ID, your UID will never work in Delhi. He said, Why, what's wrong with Delhi? I said, everybody's asked, you know, don't you know I am? Everybody's identity. It's supposed to be known, you don't need a UI. <laughs> this is a Delhi culture. Hopefully it's not here. No, all I'm saying is, you know, I think this culture permeates very widely in society. So I think there are societal views that are there. You're right, it has to start from education and school. But the school, the school teacher, the parent, I think it's it's the nexus of all. So unless you can build a general climate where this is there, today easy money is the thing that's there. Materialistic values are very high. Not good or bad. I'm not. I'm not making a value judgment. I'm saying that's the reality. People are spending. You read these horrible cases, you know, where school children are kidnapping their classmates, 15 and 16, for ransom. And then sometimes, recently, after one of them was killed also. I mean, this really comes from a sense that I want money here. I want money now. I mean, this clearly is not something that a 15-year-old would get unless he gets it from parents, teacher, or something in society. It's not something he has learned. It's something that's come from outside forces which are giving him these inputs. So I think there is something which we've got to question and look at, but the education system is certainly one very important part. The primary education uh, is the most, most critical and most important, and that to the small towns and small villages. Because if you talk compared to anything, it is a unique uh, case. Because you can't just take a number from Delhi, but you can take from small villages. Villages and towns, small towns, they, they make the country. True. Can I have a question? It's okay. Uh, I am Gopina Krishna. Uh, I retired scientist to a profession, CSS. I 
we are talking about the ethics, science has nothing to do with ethics, searching for truth, but we never reach. Now, the thing I am talking about. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for the trouble. Uh, thing is that when I started as a lab assistant, my salary has 150 rupees. I was very happy with that. But after my marriage, my salary was something like 1000 rupees. I was very happy. When I retired, my salary was 30,000 rupees. Now my pension is 30,000 rupees. What is happening? My standard has not gone up. You have to ask fundamental questions like truth. I am looking at truth. You have to ask what is happening to the country. Thing is this, the very government is putting black money, printing black money and distributing to you and me. We are all part of it. And the everything is going up. Everything is going up. Everybody is getting corrupt. We are where it is going to you have to have a new Rajiv Gandhi with you no corruption at all. Then only it will say, or we'll have a dictator that will Hitler or like will come in the India. That's all what is going to happen. Please, this is about ethics, nothing else. Sorry about personal things or anything. Sorry. Thanks. You know, I, I would be a little more optimistic than you. Yeah, it's true that a lot of corruption. But also keep in mind that today, a lot of it is being talked about and discussed. It wasn't necessarily being done earlier. In fact, I've seen some very good studies. And you know, this is something which is unpopular to say because most of you might disagree with me even violently. But I saw some very good professional study that showed that what you might call retail corruption, which is corruption at the petty level, has actually gone down in the last 10 years and even the last 5 years. What has increased is high profile and what you might call wholesale corruption. So, you know, hundreds of crores, thousands of crores, that has increased. But the petty corruption has actually gone down. And two reasons for that, one, maybe better systems, maybe more honesty, but also technology. Without a doubt, it's contributed to doing this. Technology and I said better process because where your competition, corruption tends to come down, not automatically, but tends to come down because you're competing things. And I'll give you one example of competition.